So good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. It's good to see you again. Welcome to the second day of our conference, New Mobilities and Evolving Identities, Islam, Youth and Gender in South and Southeast Asia. I'm sorry for making you get up very early um, on the weekend, and I know there was some trouble getting here, but I'm uh, very happy that you arrived and that we have a very pleasant weather outside. You know that um, weather in April in Germany is never predictable, so we can't complain, I think. Um, before I introduce <coughs> the two speakers in our first panel, Chance Local Feminism's New Agendas, Dr. Nida Kermani and Rafia Zaman, I would like to very briefly announce three things. First of all, I would like to thank the Gerda Henkel Foundation, the Berlin Graduate School Muslim <coughs> Cultures and Societies, and the Cluster of Excellence Normative Orders in Frankfurt for funding this conference. Secondly, uh -huh. <laughs> I would like to use this opportunity to introduce our wonderful conference team, um, Nora Derbay, <coughs> Fatima Giuliano, <laughs> Nadia Danilenko, and Jakob Rosener. <coughs> This conference would not have been possible without them. So many thanks to all of you. Um, it was and it is a great pleasure to work with you. And thirdly, I would like to draw your attention to the PhD poster presentation of all the doctoral candidates who will participate in the Young Researchers Roundtable discussion this afternoon. Our two speakers this morning are Dr. Nida Kermani and Rafia Zaman. Dr. Kirmani is currently an assistant professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at Lahore University of Management Sciences. She holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Manchester, and a monograph based on her PhD thesis is forthcoming with Routledge India under the title, Questioning the Muslim Woman, Space, Identity, and Insecurity in an Urban Locality. Nida also participated in, the pre, in our pre-conference workshop last year, and I'm very happy that she came here again to participate in this conference, so welcome back, Nida. <coughs> Rafia Zaman is presently pursuing her doctoral program at the Center of Political Studies, School of Social Sciences at Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, on a study titled Gender, Community, and Citizenship, Muslim Women's Activism in Contemporary India, Rafia is currently a doctoral research fellow at the Institute of Asian and African Studies at Humboldt University and she'll be in Berlin until the end of the month. Welcome to both of you and I look forward to your presentations. Um, I'm tiny so this is covering most of me but hopefully you can still see my face. Um, hello, uh, I'm just trying to get my head together after that long journey here but it was fine, it was lovely. Um, anyway, so. Today I'm going to be uh, presenting a paper that I am working on. It's basically ongoing research um, that I've been doing for the past um, three or four years in India and now in Pakistan where I've been for the past year. Um, so previously I was looking at the Indian women's movement's uh, relationship with religion and particularly looking at um, the emergence of Muslim women-led networks, which I'll talk about. Um, and then since I moved to Pakistan, over a year ago now, I was interested in looking at similar issues across the border in a very different context in which Muslims are uh, the majority and the political climate is, of course, uh, very different from that, uh, that in India. Um, and to see how women's rights activists negotiate these two very different contexts when it comes to questions of gender and religion, which, as we know, um, are very heated, uh, thorny issues. So I'll just start, um, but I'm going to try to talk about a lot of things that are very complicated very quickly, so please forgive me if I simplify anything. Um, you know, of course, I understand that even terms like the women's movement is something that's contested in both contexts, but I won't get too into the debates about that, uh, just realizing that women's movements are very diverse um, entities that are constantly shifting and uh, contested in both places. Um, but the main question is how have the contemporary Indian and Pakistani women's movements engaged with Islam as part of their um, strategies for securing women's rights? 
So with the Indian move, win, women's movement, I will very quickly talk about the situation pre-1990 or the 90s um, and the controversy over Muslim personal laws. I won't get into it because many of us already know that story. But, um, and for those of us who don't, then maybe we can talk about it later. Um, and what happened post-90s in India with the development of these Muslim women-led networks that I'll be talking about. And then I'll shift over to Pakistan and what's been the situation there pre-90s where the main issue was um, the Hudud ordinances and Zia, Zia al Haq's Islamization program, which was extremely aggressive and um, targeted women's rights amongst other issues, uh, the rights of minorities, women, they all became very symbolic in his, in his program. Post 90s, what's happened in Pakistan where the women's movement has diversified quite a bit. And then I'll try to compare both of the contexts to see how things have shaped up vis-a-vis um, -vis Islam, why have women's rights activists chosen diff similar and different strategies in both places. And there's a lot of overlap actually in uh, the issues that they've been dealing with. So if we're talking about the Indian women's movement, um, how, how much time do I have an idea? Sorry. Okay. Um, the, early, the early women's rights activism in, and we're talking about the subcontinent now, pre-independence um, pre and even post-independence, women's rights activists had a largely um, conciliatory relationship with religion, <coughs> Islam and Hinduism. Um, they, they weren't very confrontational. They tried to work from within um, religious texts or use re religious symbols in support of their arguments. Um, but later on, uh, when the contemporary women's movement emerged in the 70s, um, similar to many of the women's movements that were emerging around the world at the time, the women's movement in India had a much more confrontational and contentious uh, relationship with religion, and particularly with Hinduism at that time. So a lot of the issues that they took up were um, affiliated with, uh, you know, were considered to be Hindu, had their, have their roots in Hinduism, so the practice of dowry or sati, um, were both issues that um, you know, raised a lot of opposition from Hindu uh, right-wing groups when they, when they were brought up. And the women's movement confronted these issues and basically saw religion in general as a patriarchal, um, patriarchal construct that was oppressing women that they needed to resist. Of course, there were exceptions with that as well. And there were a lot of feminists during the 80s and 90s who also tried to have a more um, proactive relationship with religion and with Hinduism in particular. So for example, the first feminist publishing house in India being called Kali for Women. Kali is a Hindu goddess, as you know. So trying to co-opt certain symbols, um, particularly the goddess um, image as a means of empowering women as well. But what ended up happening with that was they um, alienated women from minority communities, including Muslim women, and Dalit women um, who felt left out of the movement, who, as it was, weren't, um, were not very prominent in the women's movement at that time. And then you have the issue of personal laws come up in the, in the 1980s with Shabano, and many of you know this case, but it was a woman who was claiming maintenance from her husband after divorce, and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that she, yes, indeed, she sh it has a right to maintenance from her husband, but then, at that time, the Hindu right was gaining a lot of power in India, so the Muslim conservative groups were also on the defensive, and they saw the state kind of, this is a, an example of state intrusion in the affairs of the community, and they saw themselves as the protectors of the community. Um, and in all of these debates, so the women's movement as well was put in a very funny position if they defended the rights of Muslim women to have, um, to have protection from the state, then they would be alienating or seen to be siding with the Hindu nationalists. Um, if they didn't, then they would be, you know, going against their principles of protecting women's rights, so what would they do? And there were lots of debates in the women's movement at this time. But what became clear was that Muslim women themselves had very small role within the women's movement. And um, there was a lack of Muslim women's participation in those debates. There were a, a few women who were participating who were Muslim themselves, but really it became very apparent that the women's movement in India had been dominated by upper caste, um, upper class, urban Hindu women. So what's happened since the 90s? 
Um, we have the emergence of two networks that I'll be talking about. And I'm presenting these networks as very cohesive kind of entities, but of course, these networks are also shifting and contested, um, and they're just two networks amongst a huge, um, you know, India being a huge country with lots of different issues that I'm not, a that I'm not able to speak about. These two networks are largely based in North India and in Bombay in particular. Um, so the first one that I looked at was one called the Muslim Women's Rights Network, which emerged in 1999 and was led by this uh, NGO called Avaz in Niswan that many of you might be familiar with. And this was a loose network of NGOs um, that were, some of them were run by Muslim women, some of them were not, some of them were focused on Muslim women's rights, some of them were not, but what brought them together was the fact that they had a common concern about Muslim women's rights. Um, so they worked on issues related to personal law, when you're talking about Muslim women in India, personal law is the first a set of issues that comes up because personal law is one of the main issues in which Muslim women are defined as a separate category um, and have to deal with a separate set of laws. Um, they also work on other issues like drawing attention to the fact that Muslim women have multiple identities, that they're a diverse group of people, that you know you can't define women just by their religious identity. So it's a funny kind of tension where they're trying to question the category itself but also using it as a means of organizing. Um, and they're taking a largely secular human rights based approach according to them. Um, and advocating for a gen gender justice law rather than a separate set of Muslim personal laws. So a gender justice law that would include all women or apply to all women and that wouldn't be based on any one religion. Um, so that's basically their position and the reason for this, one of the reasons is that they feel like they would like a unified, um, they want to be part of the larger women's movement. They see themselves as part of the larger women's movement in India and they don't want Muslim women to separate off and have their own um, sub-movement. So they see this network as part of the women's movement. Uh, Hasina Khan, who is one of the leaders of this network, says that Muslim women do need to make a space for themselves, but this does not mean that Muslim women make their own space and also carry, carry out their struggle alone. If we say this, then we might become divided. Then we will say that Hindu women also should fight for their own rights and create their own space. We will not be able to call ourselves a women's movement. There will be a Muslim women's movement, a Hindu women's movement, a, and a Christian women's movement. So they want to keep the women's movement together. They don't see the need for a separate space only for Muslim women. In contrast to this network is a second network that I looked at called the Bharati Muslim Mehila and Dolan, and Rafi is going to speak about them in more detail, so I won't talk about it too much. But they um, developed in later on in 2005, 2006. Um, and many of the activists involved in the Muslim Women's Rights Network broke away and formed this separate network for a variety of reasons. So I'm not gonna make it seem like it was only the question of religion and the relationship of the network with religion that caused them to split, but that was one of the contentious issues. So some people were not happy with the Muslim Women's Rights Network's relationship or position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Islam. This network is also a network of NGOs as well as individuals across the country, but mainly in UP, Maharashtra, and Gujarat, where, men, where their leaders are situated. Um, and the numbers, I'm not sure. I mean, it's a, I don't know, what they, they probably claim they have more than 20,000 members now. Maybe Rafia can shed light on this. But there's several thousand members anyway. Um, they focus also on personal laws, and they also focus on socioeconomic rights of Muslim women. Um, and they combine both secular um, human rights approaches and Islamically framed approaches, advocating for a reform set of Muslim personal laws. So rather than saying that Muslim personal laws shouldn't exist, they say Muslim personal laws should be based on their, what they think is a true interpretation of Islam, which is one based on principles of equality and justice. So they, they advocate this kind of um, feminist interpretation of Islam or Islamic feminism, if you want to call, call it that. Um, so they want women to take back Islam and take it back from the mullahs and from the right, from the right wing and project a true version which would protect women's rights. So Noor Jahan Safiya Niaz, who's one of the leaders of this network, says that and basically it's not realistic to ask Muslim women to give up their religion in a context in which Muslims are a minority and a threatened minority. So you can ask a Muslim woman to um, 
you know, given the situation that the community is going through, um, if you go and tell this Muslim woman who is a minority within a minority, look down with your religion, I want you to come out on the streets and protest and demand your rights, but please keep your religion within your house. That was our point of departure with the mainstream women's movement. I'm a Muslim and I'm not apologetic about that and I do not want to deny my identity. So they're trying to allow Muslim women to keep their identity as Muslim women but also claim their rights. So they're, not say, they're saying there isn't a tension between these two things. You shouldn't have to make a choice between being a woman who wants to claim her rights and being a Muslim. Um, and it's not realistic to ask people to give that up in India. So what, you know, what these two networks represent is there's a real change in the women's movement in India. It's become more dynamic and more diversified and more fragmented. And the sites of dynamism are often in these places where you know, Muslim women are taking the lead or you see Dalit women as well emerging as leaders in India. These are new developments since the 90s. Um, and they're very exciting, where they're challenging the kind of unified representation of women or allowing people to represent women of minority communities. Um, they challenge the dominant construction of the Muslim woman as being oppressed and passive, and they're reclaiming women's right to representation from, <coughs> from the men who've been representing them and also from the um, leaders of the women's movement who have been largely upper caste Hindu women. Okay, so if we move to Pakistan really quickly. In Pakistan, again, you have the early women's movement not confronting Islam head on and actually working with, in, not within a religious flame framework, but at least drawing on religion in order to create laws that would be protective of women's rights. So you have the Muslim Family Laws Ordinance in 1961, which is actually relatively progressive um, compared to the situation in other Muslim <coughs> majority countries and women's rights are protected within that, and they didn't face a lot of opposition from the religious uh, right wing. But then the <coughs> 1980s, everything shifts, as you know, in Pakistan, and Ziaul Haq comes into power, and he introduces this uh, aggressive Islamization program that targets women's rights. And so at that time, you see the women's movement really emerging um, in a much more um, co cohesive fashion with a lot more strength, and particularly this Women's Action Forum, which many of you might have heard about emerges in the 80s in response to Zia's Islamization program. And there was a debate within WAF during the 80s about whether they should take a secular human rights based approach or whether they should work from within a religious framework. And this was a real debate because the Hudud ordinances were being uh, portrayed as being a religious set of laws. And these women were saying, look, this isn't actually the only way that Islam can be interpreted. So should we tell people that this is a wrong interpretation of Islam or say that this is a human rights violation. And what ended up happening was they tried engaging with Islam through the 80s and they weren't successful. And by the end of the 80s, they decided that taking a more human rights based approach made more sense in the Pakistani context. And, um, and even though the Hudud ordinances weren't repealed, they were reformed in 2006, but that was much later than when they were introduced. Um, that reform as well wasn't necessarily the, a product of taking an Islamic feminist approach. Um, so this is from an interview I did recently with Hina Jalani, who's a famous human rights lawyer in Pakistan. And she's very adamant that taking a secular human rights based approach is the most sensible strategic um, approach for the women's movement in Pakistan. And the reason for this was she said the state was promoting it as a religion, itself as being religious. For the first two years, we fell into that trap, but then we realized that it's not going to work. Personally, we have nothing for or against religion. I personally don't think that Islam is anti-women, and if you want to make it work so that it's woman-friendly, then that's fine. But this wasn't our stance for very political reasons. If the government is basing its laws on religion, then only that interpretation of religion will prevail, which is acceptable to those in power. We don't want women's rights to be fluctuating. We did not go, we did go to the universal and international human rights framework because for us that was a necessity. We wanted an anchor, a sound anchor to work for women's rights so that the national political environment of the country could not dislodge the concept that we are trying to get accepted. So religion did not figure as a point of reference. Basically the state's interpretation of religion for her, she said that's always gonna win. 
So if the state's interpreting religion in a manner that's anti-women's rights, that's extremely conservative, which it, it is in Pakistan, then women's rights activists referring to religion, they're not gonna win that argument because they're not the ones who are seen to have the final authority in interpreting Islam. So best to use a separate set of um, discourses, the universal human rights framework, which will supersede the religious, or at least not go there. And if you're not going there at all, then you're not getting involved in that debate, and you're saying, regardless of whether your interpretation or my interpretation is correct, these are human rights, international human rights, and Pakistan signed up to CEDAW, for example, and you must respect that. And they found that as a more um, sensible strategy. So since the 90s, again, the women's movement has diversified in Pakistan. Most of the women's rights activists I've spoken to are committed to taking a more human rights-based approach to um, promoting women's rights. But then, of course, at certain times, women's rights activists, even if they present themselves as being secular, and um, you know, pro-human rights, they also must engage with Islam in the context of Pakistan. There's no way around it. So in, for example, the campaign to reform the Hudud ordinances, um, they presented religious arguments to le legislators in order for them to be able to counter the, the religious right. And they were successful in passing the Women's Protection Act, which took the teeth out of the Hudud ordinances. And that was a real victory. Um, working at the community level, a lot of the activists that I've spoken to, they talk about how at the community level one does need to um, oftentimes at least clear up um, confusions about certain women's rights being going against Islam and telling people, look, there's different interpretations of Islam and Islam can be interpreted in a way that protects women's rights as well. So even if it's not an official strategy to, to be doing this, at the community level, one does often need to have a reserve of religious-based arguments that you can pull out as necessary to defend, um, to defend yourself. So there is a, a recognition that there's, an, there's a necessity to strategically engage with religion. So Menaz Khan, who works for the Orit Foundation, says, I think completely giving up on re a religious approach is wrong, because then you completely relinquish to them, the religious right, the weapons that they then use to attack you. So you have to kind of walk this fine line where you're, you're able to protect yourself against attacks from the religious right, but then you're also able to use human rights approaches to counter their interpretations. Uh, Shirkat Ga, which um, we spoke about, Mina spoke about yesterday, um, Farida Shaheed said to me that, you know, we're a secular organization. However, in the last four or five years, there has been a religious discourse happening at the village level, which wasn't there before. Therefore, we have run training course using Islam. Um, to promote women's rights and try to understand the issues that are coming up and try to facilitate the necessary progress, progressive, progress of Islamic scholars going and engaging with people. But this is not an area that we've engaged with a lot. So she says that, you know, at times they must engage with uh, religious discourses, but it's not their main strategy. If we look at both of the movements, women's rights activists in both contexts are responding to the political manipulation of Islam um, with religion representing the nation in Pakistan or religious religion representing the community in India. And they're trying to counter this unitary um, representation of religion and saying, this, look, there, there are multiple interpretations. Um, women's rights activists in both contexts are gravitating towards a more human rights-based framework. There are exceptions. There's the BMMA. There's other activists in India who are engaging with more Islamic feminist types of approaches. But you see in both contexts that they're still holding on to the human rights-based um, framework. And one of the reasons for this was that both countries are religiously diverse. Of course, India more so than Pakistan, but even in Pakistan. So they want to create an inclusive movement, one that includes women from minority communities as well in Pakistan. Also, a lot of these women lack knowledge about Islam. They don't feel like, you know, they say, we're not going to win if we're playing on the mullah's wicket. We're never going to have the level of Islamic knowledge that they have, that's not our area of expertise, so let's just not go there, because we're probably gonna lose that argument. They also realize that there's multiple interpretations of Islam, and in both contexts you have most women's rights activists being committed to secularism for a variety of reasons that we can talk about. Um, in Pakistan, I, f I mean, this is a generalization, but I'll just end on this, and maybe we can dis discuss it. Uh, in the discussion, but I, I feel like in India there's a little bit more space to engage with Islamic discourses. Um, in Pakistan, 
even though it is a Muslim majority country and it's defined in many ways by its religious identity, I don't feel like I haven't seen as much of an effort to proactively engage with Islam as, as I've seen in India. And one of the reasons for this maybe is that in India, Muslim women are defined as Muslim women because of their minority status, so they have to constantly confront their religious identity, whereas in Pakistan, Muslim women, for the most part, you know, the majority of women in Pakistan are Muslim women, so they don't think of themselves as such, and they can kind of identify in other ways, uh, not only be identified by their religious identity. In Pakistan as well, women's rights activists have tried to engage with Islam, and they haven't found it to be a successful strategy. So they've, they've learned from their past mistakes, and they said this is a dead end. And we've, most of the rights that have been gained for women in Pakistan, the last year we've had six sets of laws that are uh, protecting women's rights. So it's been a great year for legislation, but the way that they've won these rights hasn't been through religiously framed arguments. So their experience is that this is actually not their strategy for success. They've been more successful in using the Constitution and using international human rights framework in order to secure women's rights. And religious discourse in Pakistan is so far to the right that I think this notion that one could introduce Islamic feminism in Pakistan, I, I mean, they're so far out of that, uh, that, what the dominant discourse is, that I think most women's rights activists realize that if they go there, they're, you know, they're basically their voices won't be heard because the discourse is, has really shifted so far to the right. Um, there's hardly any progressive Islamic scholars left in Pakistan. Some of them have been killed, others have left. Speaking about religion is actually dangerous. I mean, it's threatening to your life. So a lot of women's rights activists would probably choose not to go there because it's actually you know, a threat to their life. Oh, good morning, everyone. My title is Reframing the Issues, Muslim Women's Activism in Contemporary India. Um, some of the introduction that I had to do has already been done by Nida, and she's covered it up till the point of the formation of BMMA. So I'll jump right into that. Um, but uh, in my paper, what I try to do is uh, that I t try to interrogate the framing that takes place around Muslim women. And I think that the question of frames is very important because activists in the Muslim world have increasingly become self-conscious about the manner in which they are going to voice the op uh, op opposition to the patterns of patriarchy that they confront in their societies. And uh, the ideas of frame is thus employed at two levels in this paper. The first in which Muslim activists in India frame the issues confronting them. And second, the manner in which this activism is then framed in the larger context of the feminist movement and more specifically I am focusing on Bharatiya Muslim Mahila Andolan and uh, at the second level I am talking about uh, how recent years have witnessed a considerable and growing focus on women and religion especially in the context of Muslim community religion which was once seen as an obstacle to development has now become the solution as women uh, who were the victims now get become the catalysts of change and uh, this converges with uh, the way in which Muslim women themselves might also be approaching and uh, I want to then problematize the category of Islamic feminism as something that may not be very apt in all situations. Uh, the rights of Muslim women have in fact enjoyed a lot of space and attention. On the one hand, uh, there was continuously literature which posits Muslim women as victims of Islamic patriarchy and its laws and uh, tropes which have had a very long trajectory beginning from colonial in the colonial encounter. On the other hand, were also texts which constantly keep emerging from uh, Islamist 
classical texts, neo-traditional texts, which uh, claim women's position in an Islamic worldview and the rights enjoyed by them. And both these kinds of engagements on Muslim women privilege Islam in texts, ignoring lived realities, contexts, and how being Muslim may vary across various contexts. There's also been accompanying tropes of either the victim or the words of the community. And uh, the situation is not very different in India. Uh, Nida has already covered a lot of what I wanted to talk about. But uh, uh, basically, s uh, in the last uh, two decades, there has been uh, this uh, considerable intensification of communal politics, where uh, women occupy a large amount of space in public debate. They are identified as victims of their community, as objects of reform, as a counter image of the emancipated Hindu woman, on which the right wing uh, uh, groups of the BJP, the RSS, Shiv Sena, which is the Hindu right wing, can carry out their own propaganda, and also as symbols on which the Muslim community can mark out its own identity. Uh, Nida has already pointed out that uh, family law in India is uh, separate for various communities. Uh, actually, reforms have taken place uh, in some ways to make uh, laws in other communities more gender just. And this is missing in the Muslim context. And uh, the feminist organizations, uh, there were very few minority women, something that uh, Nida has already talked about. And uh, the way in which minority women got framed, it was, again, uh, following a very the very discourse uh, that was happening in the larger public domain, where uh, it was the personal laws of the community uh, which were criticized, and usually be, uh, Muslim became was absent from the development discourse and as citizens. And at the same time, women from the Muslim community have been marked by identity in terms of uh, choices, in terms of uh, personal law, communal violence. They generally belong to a low income group, low educational attainment, low aspiration groups, and are one of the most vulnerable women uh, in the Indian context. BMME uh, emerges at a particular juncture, and uh, it gets framed by what is happening in the larger political context. Uh, there is the shadow of what happened in Gujarat in 2002, where uh, suddenly the context of identity became very strong. It was physically manifest. And uh, one may also remember that 9-11 had just happened and the way Muslim was being constructed post 9-11. On the other hand was the Sacha Committee report which was tabled in 2006 which provided data which questions the long-held rhetoric of the Hindu right that uh, the Muslim community is pampered. And uh, in fact the Sacha Committee report was becoming the rallying point on which uh, many new political formations have emerged in the Muslim community which are accusing the uh, leadership of the ulema and saying that they have been obsessing with the preservation of personal law with the cost of development concerns. Uh, and the third was the Imrana case. I don't know how many people will know about the Imrana case, but uh, uh, this was a woman who was raped by her father-in-law and then uh, filing a complaint uh, with the local uh, bodies. There are always extrajudicial uh, bodies which are mediating in these kind of disputes. Uh, uh, the local panchayat as well as the local Malvi declared her haram or forbidden uh, to her husband and she was told to leave the marital home and it was only with the intervention of women's groups and uh, in fact uh, one of the founders of BMMA that is Nani Shastran was very active in this case and she points out that it also, also showed that uh, the kind of impasse that had come in talking about Muslim women's rights in India had to be negotiated and uh, that Probably the movement was, uh, towards UCC was not happening and one has to uh, start talking about uh, Muslim women's rights and the way the community gets structured and who has the right to say how women are going to be treated, all of these have to be tackled. So, uh, what, but what was also new about this organization was that it sought to link the inferior position of Muslim women in Indian society to not merely personal law but to wider structural factors. It highlighted that it is not possible to talk of the rights of Muslim women without addressing the Muslimness of the community itself. They raised issues of social, cultural, and economic marginalization and the threat of communal politics. And as a result, they were raising questions not only for the leadership of the community, but also the Indian state and its failure to deliver. And this positioning was an important and new one, especially when it looks at the manner in which Muslim women have generally been talked of up to now. 
Uh, more recent academic uh, work, however, such as that of Soya Hassan, has started questioning the rhetoric of uh, triple talaq, polygamy, etc., in which Muslim women generally get framed, in order to look at more specific ways in which marginal uh, marginality of Muslim women could be understood. BMMA's approach appeared to share this vision, and the question of development was linked with that of Muslim women's empowerment, in which of which reform in personal law was one part of the agenda. Poverty, underdevelopment, communalism, illiteracy, they said has to be tackled very urgently and it's only then when that we can talk about laws. There was also another important shift from previous positions, especially that of the first umbrella outfit, which was the Muslim Women's Rights Network, uh, which was operating since 1999. In fact, most of the women who formed DNA were part of the previous networks and uh, they felt that one has to attach a positive value to being Muslim and also to Islam and I've already talked about the context uh, in which it emerges and Naisha Sun, one of uh, the founder members, she says that having gone to Gujarat in 2002 to work in the relief camps somehow made one more sensitive to one's identity. The victims were targeted because they were Muslim. Come in that, the everyday practices such as that of a colleague who would not share a meal put a huge question mark on the secularity of organizations who said that we are working for women. BMMA was critical of the larger feminist movement in its failure to accommodate the Muslim cultural identity and its own biases were, but were equally critical of the Muslim Women's Rights Network, uh, which they said that took a very narrow view of the secular by constantly claiming that all religions are patriarchal it did not respect that for many women, religion is an important aspect of their self. Therefore, BMMA self-consciously promoted certain markers of identity. In fact, uh, if you attend any workshop or conference or talk, then they, they always go into uh, claiming that we have uh, identities of being citizens of India, of being Muslims, and of being women. And Satya Suman, who is another co-founder, says that as Muslims, as women, we have to fight on many fronts. We have to claim our rights as citizens, but we also have to take on the spaces of occupied by obscurantist voices in our community, and the MMA seeks to position itself uh, as an alternative voice from within the community. So it is critical of the traditional leadership, and it says that maybe we are now ready and we are going to say something. And uh, thus it tries to negotiate both the idea of being victim and ward, and it also has to, uh, it's also tried to negotiate what being secular may not always mean being anti-religious. However, even as they invoke a Muslim identity and they talk of Islam, there's always been a tension as it constantly evokes its rights as citizens and also a secular constitution. Uh, there's no time, so I won't focus on the developmental work, but a lot of their work has actually tried to look at developmental patterns and but uh, in the last few years there has been this slippage between saying that uh, we are going to read Islam as something which is compatible with our demands to saying that what we demand is from uh, Islam itself and uh, one may say that uh, the context in which they are operating, a lot of Muslim activists who do not agree with this, uh, the shift that they have taken, uh, are usually, usually want to remain anonymous because they don't want to appear as if they are challenging. They, say, they will say that, oh, but what can we get from the Sharia? Uh, and what is going to be the final reading? And, uh, and yet they find that it has to be tackled because uh, although there have been instant, uh, they continue to use uh, Section 125 of the Criminal Procedure Code and they have been making use of the Protection Against Domestic Violence Act in their uh, own training of community workers but they also see that uh, unless someone is around to use these acts creatively it is actually very difficult to sustain uh, cases and you know, Muslim women lose out. So they are stuck in a situation where some people are not ready to take up reform. Uh, there is, um, on the other hand, uh, the point that uh, when you go out seeking uh, certain rights, they might not just be available. And uh, in practice, they found that uh, using interpretations of Islam by varying schools of thought was helpful. 
uh, according to Naish, there was a case where a uh, uh, husband had said uh, talaq, talaq, talaq in a single sitting and if they had approached Pirangi Mahal, which is located in Lucknow, he could have said that it's valid, but they got a uh, fatwa from a different uh, seminary in Delhi. And uh, uh, which said that, no, if you are uh, resuming sexual relations, then uh, it's just one talaq and therefore revocable. So they have said, they say that it's also very useful as a strategy. They also worked on the Nikanama campaign, which uh, which actually Muslim Women's Rights Network also uses. And uh, in there are obvious, uh, there are only some interests that can be safeguarded through the Nikanama campaign, and they are aware of it. And therefore, they've never been able to complete. Uh, they're not completely satisfied with whatever Nikanama uh, they've been taking up, uh, and uh, they know that it's not enough. So they are. Uh, now working on codification, uh, Muslim family law, law in India remains uncodified and with a UC, uh, uniform civil code proceeding in the background, uh, reform has to take place. And uh, at the same time they've also started networking with uh, other women in other contexts who are using uh, better uh, interpretations of uh, Islam. Uh, in order to demand rights and uh, even as they endorse and engage with these ideas there actually remains a tension in such an alliance. In fact, uh, there is always this const uh, constant uh, pressure to ask whether uh, we should be asking for reform from uh, the constitution by claiming to be equal citizens or should we be going, be going through Islam. And, uh, in fact, Khadija was one of the activists uh, involved with them. She says that it's important to claim our cultural spaces, but those which are shared and those that are Muslim, but law ultimately has to be separated from religion. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they've gone on into this codification process without invol involving the Muslim Women's Rights Network. And in February 2012, where the recent most uh, consultations happened, the main issues which were discussed were polygamy, triple talaq, custody of children, and uh, the ne uh, negotiations and codification took place through using interpretations from various schools of law. And while uh, there were agreements on limiting polygamy to the extent that it becomes impossible, it was difficult for BMMA to actually uh, press its own demand that it should be completely abolished. And similarly, the case of inheritance where the injunctions are clearly unequal and you can't use any kind of uh, interpretation, it's been virtually impossible for any kind of pre-reading to get around this. Um, what what they are finally able to negotiate is something that only time will tell, but uh, the issue of identity and reform as it gets uh, uh, formulated in this whole equation requires serious attention. Why has the Muslim once again become reduced to Islam and why has there been this slippage uh, which may not be a very productive one, is something that has to be questioned. And uh, I started the paper by asking questions of frames and uh, there has been a lot of uh, focus on BMMA as an Islamic feminist organization. And uh, they are also, uh, because they require attention in order to raise their concerns, they are also prone to some kind of sensationalist statements which uh, like we want to argue with the mullahs, uh, who are these mullahs, and it gets lapped up. And there's a lot of reportage that happens in newspapers when they make these statements, and usually none when they are talking about developmental issues. And uh, well, I, there is also the question that uh, a lot of this activism also gets, takes place in uh, hierarchical settings where uh, they may not, they lack funds, uh, there are no resources, uh, they need visibility. And uh, there is also this awareness of addressing two audiences, those who are saying that we have a monopoly in defining Islam and those who will, if they take the route of criticizing Islam, then it's going to be lapped up as a critique of their societies and they don't want to get these. But uh, the way that slippage has happened from saying that uh, Muslims are also a socio-economic category, and I think it was a better formulation from which they started and the slippage in saying that as Muslims we are going to demand our rights only through Islam and that uh, we are demanding our Quranic rights. Uh, it, uh, it's something which requires more consideration properly. And 
and in my own field work where I have concentrated more on the community workers that they deal with and with the women that uh, they have their uh, talks with or the workshops with, uh, it's very interesting how ideas unfold. They've acted as nodes of dissemination of ideas at the level of the community with very limited resources and manpower. Uh, it's actually a revalidation of Islam that uh, may reinforce the very practices that they want to work against. And uh, although it requires a certain kind of legitimacy to talk about Muslim women for, um, yeah, I think, <laughs> so that it may be just a miscalculated move. And they are actually strengthening what they want to start off against. Could you, could you please explore a bit more on uh, the differences between the category Muslim women? Are there fractions uh, you mentioned already, uh, particularly in Pakistan authority, the, the conservative of authority? How and how far does, does that reflect differentiations between Muslim women within Muslim women's movements? I mean, my whole, um, you know, when I started out studying Muslim women, then I, my whole premise was that I'm questioning the category itself. And I'm still, I continue to question the category. And I think with the networks in India, what I've said before is that they, they strategically use this category. It's called, it's a kind of strategic essentialism, right? Um, they deploy this category as a political tool in order to secure more rights for women. But Muslim women as a concept is extremely problematic and uh, scholars like Zoya Hassan have um, pointed out um, that in India, Muslim women are extremely diverse and to, to, to call this one, to, to posit that there's one homogenous category is extremely problematic when you have so many different identities that are cross-cutting. In the Pakistani context, it's even less uh, appropriate, I think, to be using this term. Um, you know, all of a sudden, women become Muslim women. Uh, th th why should why should one define in India? Okay, they're a minority community, so it kind of makes sense in that context to be identified as Muslim women because that identity, religious identity, becomes important in certain contexts, um, and more so in the last 20 years with the rise of the the Hindu right in Pakistan. You know, these are women, many of whom. I, are believers, some of whom are not, but why should we forefront their religious identity um, when we're speaking about them, when we know that being Muslim means so many different things, um, and even for an individual, being a Muslim woman shifts depending on who she's speaking to, where she is in the world, where she is in the country, you know. So I think it, it's, a, it's a very valid question, but the way that I use it is kind of as a, in inverted quotes all the time. It's a category that people are deploying, that our people are being identified as such and using that identity strategically in order to secure certain rights for themselves when it's appropriate. At other times, it's not appropriate to use that category. Um, actually, well, I was not able to get into my details. Uh, uh, the problem is that uh, their own slippage towards law, because that is actually the only way that the idea of the Muslim has always been uh, identified through personal laws, and that's been the politics of identity all through uh, in our own context in India. And uh, uh, they start off from a very good premise, saying that, you know, we have to get out of this, and we can't just talk about this. But uh, it's been more difficult to actually sustain this kind of networking, and they're increasingly being accused that, uh, look, you are not representative of the very women you uh, seek to represent. Where have been the Dalit women's, wo uh, Muslim Dalit women's voices? Where are the poor women? Where are the marginalized women? And is it all that we are talking about? Sure, these cases happen. And there has been a lot of turmoil within. And many of the members who joined in, I mean, they right now claim 30,000. But in the last one and a half, two years, it's, it's just exploding the organization is not able to sustain. And the more uh, they try to keep it intact, the only way they can have a Muslim woman that they, and you see that focus shifts. 
to, uh, January 2010, they decide that, oh, we are not going to talk about developmental issues at all. We are going to focus our energies on Muslim personal law. But that is the whole, p I mean, the starting premise was that, uh, that we cannot uh, just talk about personal laws when we are talking about Muslim and that it's a more fragmented category. In, in their initial agenda, they said that we are going to build alliances with others who are marginalized in the community, that uh, Muslim, the Muslim was used as a socio-economic category rather than just as a cultural category and a religious category. And there has been slippage which is so, so visibly there and it's parallel to the way Muslim gets constructed and in fact there can be no Muslim unless you're talking about laws. So there are several questions and everybody should use the mic so I'll just walk around and collect your questions now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, this very good talks, both of them and I had a specific question mostly for you, but probably Nita can also shed some light on that. Um, this gets to the issue that was being discussed yesterday about transnationalism, although it's a different aspect of that that I wanted to raise. Um, it was my understanding that BMMA originally was uh, conceived or was at least initially funded by an uh, international funding uh, action aid and and so I was wondering to what extent that connection has continued. Uh, I understand they still get funds from them. And to what extent do the priorities of these international organizations that are helping to fund these uh, NGOs and this movement, to what extent does that have an influence on th the way that they frame their issues and strategize and so on. That just generally what you could say about that. I have two questions uh, for Dr. Kermani. Uh, I'm sympathetic to the idea of comparison, but if it, if, if it has to be a valid one, as you suggest, it has to be a historical comparison. And I was wondering where was the entire pre-post-colonial, you know, uh, you start with the statist comparison where you start with legislation as the moment. Yeah, so you have Hudud or you have the personal law legislation and you sort of identified those as key moments. But then there is this entire history of pre-partition South Asia, which is really history of India, Pakistan and Bangladesh together. And there were, there's this entire historical imagination which would then allow you to look at from the perspective of women and not the state. And I'm here thinking of the entire extremely interesting literary creativity of Muslim women of South Asia, particularly in case of Pakistan. So Fahmi Daria's writing in 50s or 60s, or Parveen Shakir's articulation of a divorced woman, uh, that would not be written if the historical comparison is through status history. So I'm just wondering where would those kind of history come in, in this kind of historical comparison. Uh, very quickly for Rafia, uh, I was wondering, could you shed some light on the naming of this organization because it's called Bharti Mahila instead of, you know, I don't know, uh, Neswa of India, right? So why is that, uh, is that there's a particular politics of naming it uh, in a certain international parameters? Also, could you shed some more light on the way you use the argument about Muslim as a development category and how that gets played about the discourse of Muslim women, uh, because we are also talking about double marginalization, marginalization of gender, as well as, you know, really at the lower lung, rung of Indian society. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. We're all asking for more, uh, which is pretty natural when you've only had 20 minutes. Um, in the original um, proposal that made this conference possible, uh, the focus was on media and medialization and the changes brought about by the use of new media. Now, it struck me that you were able to speak very interestingly and, and in, in a very in enlightening fashion about changes within national parameters that didn't even bring the, the uh, use of media up once. Um, therefore, my question, what is the role of media here and where is translocalism 
in uh, the phenomena you are studying, and that ties back to the original question by Professor Vatuk. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for both the talks. Uh, uh, my my biggest fear behind uh, with associated with conferences as this is um, uh, is is whether you know by discussing the very devilish sort of aspects of something or not so devilish aspects of something, we are actually in in more ways than one reinforcing the category. So by speaking about the nation state, we actually do induce the idea of the nation state. Um, I was wondering if it makes sense to reflect rather than on the whole idea of the, I mean, that is of course a part of the debate and it's important, the idea of the Muslim woman, whether it makes sense to sort of deflect the needle of the compass a bit more towards the direction of the secularism debate in India, which I think uh, is rather diversified by itself. So you have, I mean, the, the Congress as one of the major political actors in India talking about this huge national unified space with its argumentations for secularism. You have the right wing and you have the BJP who use secularism as a sort of a stick to beat the Muslim minorities with when it comes to the personal code. And you have the minorities also using the very same terminological common ground to, to sort of uh, protect their uh, community rights. So uh, my, my very precise question in that sense would be, wh how do organizations like the BMMA actually, if, if at all, uh, really in, in death reflect or debate upon the idea of secularism. It seems as if it is an assumed category which just exists. And let's talk about Islam and women now. So, yeah. Um, thank you. I wanted to quickly get back to um, what has been said right now, but also to the uh, socio-economic dimension you were mentioning in the reply to Professor Schröter's question. And um, what would you think about the idea that um, this kind of uh, identifying people or communities by a certain term, such as Muslim for a certain community of women, has to do with um, the social cleavages that, that, that seem to be uh, important and prevalent at a particular period in time. And I was just relating with um, Professor Pilitz uh, that we might think of South Africa when you had the term white women, knowing that there is a, a high diversity um, among this group of women, but still it was the label white women because the social cleavage was between um, whites and, and, and non-whites. Um, so I was just wondering whether there is a connection to a prevalent and important social cleavage and this kind of labeling. I know you asked the question, I, I'm sorry, I'm apologizing right now, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer all of the questions, but they're really useful comments, um, and I'll do my best to respond. Uh, the issue of transnationalism, um, I think you were, you were asking about Action Aid and BMMA, and maybe Rafia can speak about that, since uh, she was focusing on the BMMA more than I was. Um, but I think in Pakistan it's also very relevant, and this whole issue of Islamic feminism itself is tied in with these transnational discourses. And I think one of the points of my looking at Pakistan, uh, or looking at this the question in Pakistan that I think is so interesting is that in Pakistan we've been grappling with these issues for years. I mean, of course, since Pakistan was created on the premise of religion, and then, you know, since the 80s, women's rights activists have had to to struggle with this issue of whether to work from a, a religious framework or not. And this whole, this whole new interest internationally in Islamic feminism, if you go and talk to women's rights activists in Pakistan, a lot of times you'll get and say that term or ask some questions about religion, there's almost a sense of like, come on, we've done this, we've been doing this for 30 years, why are you asking us this now? And it's because there's, you know, we have to look globally at why these questions are being raised and then why 
you know, people like me are doing this kind of research in Pakistan. Um, and, and they're a little bit frustrated with the push to engage with religion um, that's taking place. They feel like they're being pushed, some of the activists I've spoken to, by donors to actively engage with religion or frame things in, a, in an Islamic manner when that may not be appropriate. Um, and that push is coming from donor agencies, and I'm actually looking into that now um, in my own research. Um, and I can't say anything too concrete about it beyond just anecdotal um, evidence that there is a, a transnational, that a push from international organizations to, to frame things in a particular way, and that is shaping the discourse locally um, in ways that, you know, some people are extremely critical of. Um, the issue of uh, comparison, I think that's a, I think the whole notion of comparing is, is, is problematic. Um, so there's certain issues that one could compare and that would be productive. So I thought, you know, there are some parallel processes that we see taking place in India and Pakistan in the last couple of decades. Um, and it's interesting to look at the legislative shifts in both places and how women's rights activists have responded. And I think, you know, we can learn a little bit from the different strategies looking at, at both contexts. Um, but there's a lot that you can talk about if you're trying to compare, and there's a lot of very interesting um, stories of resistance or um, endeavors by women in both countries um, who may or may not identify themselves as Muslim women. Um, so I'm sure Femi Darya is, would, you know, I wouldn't think of her as a Muslim woman writer. She's just a Pakistani woman writer who, you know, I don't, is to frame her as a Muslim woman that itself, I think I would question that, depend, you know what I'm saying? Now we're talking about Muslim women, um, and in which case religious identity becomes so important. Um, but I think there's a lot of interesting stories that I can't tell by doing this comparison, so I think it's a, it's a good point um, that I would definitely take on board. The issue of the media, I didn't talk about the media, but of course the media is extremely important in both countries in terms of the way women's rights activists are uh, putting forth their claims. Um, and maybe Rafia can talk about India, but in Pakistan, women's rights activists are extremely skilled now at, at using the media um, in order to put across their, their claims. And oftentimes, the interesting thing that happens in Pakistan, you have these talk shows in which you'll have a mullah pit against a feminist, and you have these debates that happen so it's like the, the, the media helps construct this binary, and then women's rights activists also feed into it, and relig the religious right wing feeds into it as well. And that's how things get framed. So it's women's rights against Islam still. Um, the media um, have one very important role to play, as you said, but appropriating media and communication skills are very essential and this is also how uh, the transnational dialogue that uh, Mina was talking about yesterday is actually happening. So I think it's very important and without the internet um, it would be close to impossible to organize. I mean if you think just of the size of, of such a huge ca large country as India, it would be impossible to meet and organize, set up meetings, uh, etc. So it's um, very essential but also what Mina was talking about, that you know of each other, you know the debates, you know uh, the next conference that is going to happen, you know that there's a conference on, or on Islamic feminism taking place in Madrid or Barcelona. And um, we were discussing the, the um, what Zakia um, was saying from BMMA was saying about um, how they uh, observe what Musawa is doing, for example, and, and um, take some inspiration, for example, um, concer concerning the question that um, many young women are not interested in the personal law issue any longer, or they feel that the generation of our mothers was politicized by the Shabano case. Uh, for us, Gujarat was much more important, so uh, BMMA is also struggling to find an issue, a, a theme that is appropriate to mobilize and get young women interested. And so um, I, I think, or maybe, Rafia, you would like to, to comment on that um, very briefly. Is media, or when you look at Musava's website and you see the Young Women's Caucus, for example, I think this is being observed and discussed in many, many 
context, and that's another very important translocal or transnational dimension of knowing what others are talking about and um, communicating with them. Um, well, uh, actually, uh, how much? Uh, I'll talk about the internet first. I don't know how much it helps in the networking of, I mean, probably uh, this is a network of NGOs and yes, so leaders of the NGOs, yes, but does it actually net help network community workers? No, with very low literacy levels, uh, lack of resources? No, I don't think. What they do have access to is uh, newspapers and the radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, uh, the thing is that uh, a lot of what, the way it works out, I mean, even in that initial time when they were trying to talk about socioeconomic development, um, there was not much attention to them. And the media reportage, and, and also <coughs> what is available on the internet, for instance, is just when they make these sensational things about being against the mullahs. Or uh, they worked out, uh, Naish Hassan's own nikah was worked out as this huge big affair where the newspapers were claiming that, oh my god, these mullahs are raging because there's been this new revelation. And but there was actually, YouTube. yeah, but there was actually nothing. I mean, it was actually a complete fizzle. So they don't even know what they're engaging with. But because they want to sensationalize, and that's the only way they're going to be there. And so much of it is, I mean, they're not autonomous movements. They depend on funds, and the funds come for certain things. It's a complete. Yeah, I think that uh, what BMMA at least was trying to negotiate was that uh, it was saying that, look, uh, the larger feminist movement is not secular enough because it does not incorporate the Muslim. So it's made the separation between religion and cultural expressions of your identity for the Hindu woman. But it does not do that the same for the Muslim woman, that everything is religious everything becomes religious and it has nothing to do with culture and uh, I mean for instance Khadija for instance is very critical she says that uh, there has to be this distinction between what are uh, the cultural forms that a society takes and many of those are shared and uh, there has to be the separation and they were equally critical of also the Muslim Women's Rights Network because Hasina Khan takes a very very rapidly uh, secular approach which says that no expression of Muslimness, and they said that no. If you're be you're calling yourself a Muslim women's organization, there has to be a space for Muslim. And in fact, uh, the initial things that they talked about was that when women get together, they want to sing, uh, sing a nath, for instance, for entertainment, and those other kinds of things that should be allowed, or that you know, uh, for instance, milads take place, and uh, usually. There are readings of the Quran, but then women gather around, they talk about issues, and they said that these are ways in which you can enter the community and have a focus in what you're discussing, that you shouldn't completely give up. So yeah, it was also an engagement of how the secular works out. This, uh, I know you weren't asking about Pakistan, but I think secularism is uh, you know, as important in Pakistan as, I mean, the debate's extremely important there as well. And for most women's rights activists and human rights activists in general, they're very um, adamant that they are secular in their approach and they make it a point to say it. And I think that's a really political position in Pakistan, considering the state, the Islamization of the state that we've seen in the last 20, 30 years. So even though, because secularism has gotten a bad name in Pakistan, as it has in India, for a, d a different set of reasons, but Zia al Haq made secularism synonymous with Ladiniyat, uh, you know, being without religion, when in fact, so now a lot of activists are trying to at least quietly say, look, secularism doesn't mean being without religion, it means a separation, and we're gonna express that, and that's why it's important for us, even if strategically these activists actually do have to engage with religion at various points in their work, they're still officially, they want to say, look, we're secular, and that's important to state in Pakistan, where that space has shrunk so much and is shrinking still. Thank you very much for a very, very interesting first panel this morning. <coughs> I would suggest that we have a very short coffee break or tea break now, five minutes, and then we meet and continue with the second panel. Thanks. <laughs>